Hi, I'm Rebecca Fiebrink. I'm a professor at the Creative Computing Institute at University of the Arts London, and today I'm going to talk about interactive machine learning for music. My interest in this space comes from my own background as a musician and an engineer, as well as uh, my amazing experience as a PhD student being embedded in a culture of people, including Michelle here who you see on screen, making new musical instruments. Now, these musical instruments weren't like anything that I had ever seen before or anything that had ever existed before. Um, people were doing great experimentation, taking sensors and cameras and even microphones and other devices to get information about what a performer was doing. And then instead of just taking the acoustics of whatever that action resulted in and letting the sound happen, they stuck a computer in the middle where a computer could get data to get information from those sensors, do some processing on it, and then decide how to manipulate sound synthesis parameters or sound playback or processing parameters in real time. Um, and of course, there's a, there's a whole field devoted to this creation of digital musical instruments. Uh, you can read about it at the, the NIME conference, for instance, and I'll include some links to that in my lecture materials. Now, there's some really interesting engineering and musical challenges that arise if you want to build this type of instrument. So if we think about all the ways that we might have at our disposal to get information about a performer's actions, well, there's, there's lots of good options. This is a relatively well-explored field. People have been making new musical instruments for many decades now. Um, and increasingly, the technologies that we need to get data from the world or from a performer, are, they're increasingly cheap and easy to use. However, the really important musical part comes after we get that data into a computer. It's asking and answering the question, now what? What do we do? How does this data that we're seeing here influence the sound that gets created? And we would call that um, interpreting that data, or maybe we call that mapping the data. Um, so if we were to say, OK, I've got, um, let's say a, a webcam getting information about somebody's hand and what it's doing in front of the webcam. And I want my hand, when it makes a fist, I want that to trigger one particular musical sequence. And when I have an open hand, I want it to trigger another particular musical sequence. That is my mapping, right? And creating this mapping well is really key to making an instrument that can play music that I want to perform or that other people want to listen to. It's key to making an instrument that's comfortable, that's fun, that's easy to learn, and so on. And if you imagine that I've got a webcam and I need to write a piece of computer code that looks at those pixels or other numbers coming out of the webcam and decides whether I've got a fist or an open hand, well, that's potentially a really tough problem, even for somebody who is an expert programmer. And there are other types of problems like this that we encounter in musical performance. So for instance, we may want some kind of live visuals to respond to the music that an acoustic musician is playing. In that case, we have music coming in to a computer and we're making a decision about, you know, what parameters of animation or maybe lighting do we want to change as a result? Or maybe we're doing something totally different, right? Maybe we have a robot on stage performing with us or dancing with us, and that robot might be listening to music that somebody is playing or looking at sensors attached to a musician's body. And again, somewhere in here, we have to do some processing to figure out how we interpret that data coming in from the musician, and then to decide how that translates into control over this robot. Now, people have been making musical systems with this type of format of seeing some data and then responding to it. People have been making these for a really long time, many decades by now. Um, and we can think about this um, in terms of having a little bit of code that processes some input and produces some output. And if I were to write that code in a text-based programming language, I might you know, have this input be a parameter to a function, and then I implement a function that returns something, which is my output. Or if you've used MaxMSP, you're very familiar with this idea of some inputs coming into a little box of computation, which then produces one or more outputs going out. And again, if you've ever written a, a model function like this in Max or in a text language or in any other environment, um, and you've used this to try to build something in a performance, you might have had the experience that this was difficult. It might have been tricky to try to build this function in a way that gave you the sound that you wanted and the musical interaction that you wanted. 
So this is where supervised learning as a tool can come in. Supervised learning in this lecture uh, is something we can think about as an alternative approach to building models, where we don't have to write that model function by hand in code. Um, and the key here is that supervised learning algorithms give us the ability to make these model functions without code. Instead, they build the model by looking at a set of training examples. And so if I want to build my you know, hand gesture to sound um, instrument, I could give it a set of examples where I say, here's my open hand. When you see this in front of the webcam, please make sound one. And when you see this closed fist, please make sound two, and so on. Right? So I can give a set of examples. Each one has an example of a possible input that the model might see, paired with an output that I would like the model to produce for that input. In this case, the output is just a choice of maybe a pre-recorded sample. Um, and if everything goes well, this algorithm is capable of looking at the relationships between inputs and outputs in that training data set and building a model that captures the patterns that it sees. And so then I can take the model into my performance, show it a new input, Here's another open hand. And if things have worked well, I don't even need that new input to look exactly like what it's seen before. Maybe my hand is a little bit tilted or the lighting's a bit different. And still that model should be able to make the right decision for me. In this case, making the decision that I intend to play sound number one. All right, so there's two types of machine learning um, I want to talk about today. These are both supervised learning algorithm types. The first one is classification. So um, the example I just showed you where I'm choosing sound one, sound two, sound three, that's a classification problem where my model is outputting a label or a category or a choice from amongst a, a small number of things. Um, and this label or category is sometimes called a class. These classes are mutually exclusive. So in my hand um, sound example, there's not a situation where I would say, well, I want to play both sound one and sound two, right? I'd have to um, write that into my, my sound making code um, instead. The model doesn't have a sense of like, oh, it's both of these things at once. Um, also, a classifier is always going to output one of the known categories. So if I have a training set and I have sound one, sound two, sound three as my three possible outputs, it's never going to give me a sound that it hasn't seen before. It's quite constrained. Right. Sometimes we can use classifiers to give us a probability of match, and maybe it would give me an output that says, well, I'm 75% sure that you want sound one, but 25% sure that you might want sound two instead. And of course, that could be musically useful. We could do something with that, like in the simplest case, mix between the levels of those two sounds. All right, so let's talk about some examples. What kinds of classifiers might we build if we're working with music? Well, first of all, for inputs, I already talked about a lot of different sensors and things that you could get used to get information about what a performer is doing. But of course, we're not limited to that, right? A song could be an input, a loop could be an input, a video of a performance could be an input, a MIDI file, a note, lyrics text, a person's listening history. Um, and have a think about what a classifier's output might be. What kinds of categories might be interesting to apply to these sorts of inputs, not just in a music performance, musical instrument building context, but maybe more broadly, right? We might be able to say, okay, based on what a musician is doing right now, what lighting effect should I use? Based on the audio that I see coming in, what genre is this? Or is this happy or sad? Or what instrument is playing? Um, based on who knows what, maybe I'm making a choice of which max preset um, I'm gonna use. Right? Or I could do audio analysis of the sort of, you know, what note is this? What chord is this? Um, and of course, that can be really useful if you want to build um, a model that lives inside a sort of real-time accompaniment system or a real-time improvisation system. All right, so that's classification. There's lots of other examples of how you might use that. I'll show you some examples um, in musical performance later in the lecture. The other type of machine learning I want to talk about is regression. Again, this is another type of supervised learning specifically because we have a learning algorithm that makes a model and the model is capable of taking in some input and producing some output. Now, in regression, our model output isn't a label or category anymore. 
it's just a number. And all numbers might be totally valid, right? Uh, we might be able to output 0 0.5 or 13.2 or negative 30.8 or all sorts of other things. Um, and a regression model is very capable of outputting numbers that it hasn't seen in the training data. Let me give you a non-musical example of this first. Let's say I you know, have a training data set um, and here on the left are the example inputs and on the right is the model output that I would desire for each of these inputs. So if I take a training data set where I have the input 2, output 10, input 3, output 15, input negative 4, output negative 20, a regression algorithm is going to be capable of looking at those examples and producing me a model which tries to capture the relationship between inputs and outputs. And I bet if you're a human looking at this video, you could come up with a pretty good model yourself. So have a try. All right, potentially you came up with a model which is just the function that the output is five times the input. And that would be a really reasonable model to come up with for this training data set. Um, if we were to then proceed with this model, maybe I could show the model a new input, let's give it the value one, and it's gonna output the value five for me. And as you see here, the value five looks like nothing that it's seen in the training data set, but that's not a huge problem. All right, so let's talk about musical uses of regression. So input here could still be really any of the things that we talked about before. Um, but outputs are going to look quite different. It's not going to be a choice um, from amongst certain categories, but it's going to be a thing that you might express or control with a real number. So um, again, this could be the settings of different lighting effects. It could be the sounds, um, it could be the synthesis parameters for some kind of sound patch. Um, any other kind of control parameters for a, a sound or music patch, really um, anything you might use a knob or slider to control. Right? So things like gain, tempo, EQ, filter coefficients, you name it. Right, So this is very open-ended and it can be very fun. And in fact, when I use interactive machine learning in my own music, this tends to be what I do because there's so many musical effects or control approaches that lend themselves really nicely to regression. All right, so when I began this work in around 2007, I saw an opportunity here. I had studied about machine learning, supervised learning in um, other contexts, and I knew that there had been a little bit of history of people experimenting with using supervised learning to build mappings for new musical instruments, but really nobody was using machine learning in practice. Um, and so as a PhD student, I was interested in whether we could change that. And I began with asking the question, how can we support instrument designers and other people, especially in music, um, to build interactions with supervised learning, where we have an input coming into a system which is generated by or influenced by a person, and then the output is used to control sound or some other kind of um, performative process. Now, um, turns out that taking off-the-shelf tools from other machine learning domains, whether it be medicine or finance or whatever, and just simply making them work in real time, is not sufficient. That became pretty obvious pretty quickly. If you start to think about what an instrument designer, for instance, might need, might want to think about as they build an instrument, it becomes obvious that building interactions with machine learning is different from really what I would call textbook examples that you might find if you picked up a machine learning textbook or studied in a really general purpose online machine learning course, for instance. So for one thing, um, if I'm building an instrument, I don't start with a data set, probably, that I trust, that totally captures my intentions for that instrument, right? It's very unlikely that somebody else has made that hand gesture data set already communicating which hand gestures I want to use in my instrument and how each of them should relate to a choice of sound, right? Turns out that this is um, quite different from the way you would think about training data um, if you were to take a, a conventional course, right? Where there the assumption is, well, you get the data from somewhere. It should be a good data set. There shouldn't be errors in it. But, um, you know, you kind of assume that the data you have is the data you have. Um, the next difference is that conventionally, you might 
want to evaluate models using fairly straightforward computational metrics. Um, and these metrics often are ways of estimating how a model might perform on examples outside of the training data, right? And in many real world examples, this is a great thing, right? If you imagine you're building a medical classifier and the input is information about a patient's demographics and test results and so on, and you're trying to build a model to predict, will this patient respond to a particular treatment or not, right? You really want that model to be very accurate. You want it to be as accurate as possible. And you also want it to work for patients who weren't included in the training data, right? That's the whole point. Um, and so it makes sense then to start thinking about, well, can I capture that accuracy of a classifier in a single number or small, small number of values so that I could look at two different classifiers, maybe built with different learning algorithms and compare them. And I'm probably going to say quite easily, well, this classifier, which has 99% accuracy is better than this classifier, which just has 80% accuracy, right? Um, but what does it mean for a musical hand gesture classifier to have 99% accuracy, right? What does that mean? Well, it's making mistakes on 1% of the data, but which data, right? Are these examples that are sort of fluky hand gestures where I'm transitioning from one hand position to another and I don't really care what the model does in between? Um, are they errors on, on gestures where the lighting is really bad and you can't see my hand and I can just fix that in performance? Or are they errors on the first types of hand movements that I want to use in a piece that I'm going to perform and which really I cannot have errors on those, right? So this, this doesn't tell us enough about whether a model is good enough or whether a model might be better than another. Um, furthermore, conventionally in a textbook approach to machine learning, if you are building a model as a person, your focus is really on trying to build the best model of a given data set usually, right? You say, all right, here's my data set. I'm going to assume that this captures everything that I can measure about the world in which I'm building this model. And it's this data set, we often use the word ground truth. This represents something kind of true about the world. And my model is kind of the way into getting at that truth. So I can predict more accurately, you know, how patients might respond to medical treatments, for instance, right? And so my task is to build a model that captures the patterns in that data as accurately as possible, right? Using, again, something that measures or estimates, estimates generalization accuracy. Um, and to do that, I'm going to maybe try a bunch of different learning algorithms, or I might take one type of learning algorithm like a neural network and make lots of adjustments to it, right? Change the number and sort of connections of neurons in that network or change how I train it. Um, I might also change the representation of the data, right? Um, which medical tests are useful to include, for instance, or how might I represent the, the results of those tests when I give them to my model as inputs? Um, this really ignores the fact that if your data set might be malleable, if your data set might not be the ultimate representation of some kind of truth in the world, um, we might have opportunities to improve the model through that avenue. So let's talk about this a little bit more concretely. So the software that I began building when I was a PhD student and which still exists today, um, it is used by tens of thousands of people around the world in teaching in performance and all sorts of fun applications. Um, this is called Wekinator. And I designed Wekinator to be a tool that took advantage of these differences in using machine learning for music compared to using machine learning for other more conventional applications. And the idea here is that we're building this model for prediction and there's some inputs coming into this model in real time. And if you're building an instrument, these inputs are probably coming from some sensors or some kind of data capture mechanism. And then the output from your model is being sent to some kind of control over sound or maybe, you know, animation or a game engine or something else. But if we're, again, if we're making an instrument, this is um, 
you know, quite concretely being sent to something like Max MSP or Super Collider or Chuck or some other music environment, Ableton, right? Where it's being used to tweak the parameters of how sound or music is being played or generated. Okay. Um, and I called Wekinator in my original paper, I called it a meta instrument um, because the way that you interact with it, as I hope you'll see in the demo, is itself potentially really expressive, creative, exciting, and it is something that you can perform in performance, as you can read about in my uh, original paper on Wekinator. All right, so what does Wekinator allow you to do? Well, it allows you to use classification and regression to build these models. Um, and it, again, builds these models from examples. Each example is going to have an input and an output, the output that you would like the model to produce in response to that input. Right? Um, now, Wekinator, when you launch the program, doesn't assume that you have some training data set which perfectly captures your vision for the instrument. Instead, it allows you to relatively easily do some demonstrations, demonstrate some inputs, pair those demonstrations with the values that you would like the model to produce, which are going to be sent to your um, sound creation environment, for instance, right? Um, so first of all, you can add these new examples by demonstration. Once you've built the model, you can compute some estimated generalization accuracy measures, and sometimes that's useful. But also, super importantly, you can just take that model and you can use it in real time. You can move your hand around and see what it does and see, oh, okay, does it make the sounds that I want? Um, does it, you know, when it makes mistakes, does it make mistakes in places that I care about or not? And then really crucially, it allows you to fix mistakes or make changes by going back to the training data and changing it. All right, so if I'm playing around in this stage, I'm moving my hand around and I'm listening to what the model does and I notice that, oh, you know, if I tilt my hand a little bit, it makes the wrong sound. The easiest way, the appropriate way for me to fix this in a supervised learning paradigm is to give it some examples of my hand being tilted and say, hey, when my hand is tilted like this, please still play sound one, right? So I can give that to my algorithm, I can build a new model from that algorithm, and then I can iterate. I can try that model out. Um, I can find things maybe that aren't mistakes, but I can say, oh, here, you know, I'd like it to do something different over here because I think that would be musically interesting. And again, I can communicate that by going back to the training data set and adding new training examples. Now, each of these things, um, allowing people to add new examples in real time by demonstration, allowing people to evaluate models by trying them out, and allowing people to change and improve models by changing the training data. These are all pretty unconventional things that are not usually allowed in conventional machine learning software. Um, and these um, together are what people in human computer interaction would call interactive machine learning. Um, this is a paradigm that was established a few years before Wekinator was created. A um, few human computer interaction researchers noticed that, hey, this could be a really nice way to allow people who um, have some kind of domain expertise where they're qualified to make some new examples. It could be a great way to allow them to build classifiers that, um, you know, are capable of doing some kind of human-like task. All right. One more thing I want to say about Wekinator before I show you some demos. Um, so Wekinator itself doesn't play sound. It doesn't have sensors in it. Um, it's just kind of this piece in the middle that does machine learning and builds you a model and then runs this model for you. Um, the whole system expects to get some data in. These inputs have to come from somewhere. So that could be a piece of code in Python or C++ or Max or processing or you name it. Um, and likewise, it's going to take the outputs of that model and send it somewhere else to some other piece of software, maybe Max or Chuck or Super Collider or Processing or Game Engine. Again, lots of different options. It does this by sending and receiving OSC messages. If you're not familiar with OSC, it's super cool. I, I like to call it the magic glue that allows people doing music and multimedia performance to choose the right tools for the right pieces of their 
um, creation pipeline and then just kind of patch them together. So there's messages going back and forth in real time between these different programs and it's, it's fairly simple to set up. Okay, so let's look at some demos. Um, these demos were things I recorded a while back. I look slightly different in them. Um, don't let that alarm you. I'll be back in this form shortly after they're done. All right, in this demo, I'm going to build a very simple gesture controlled drum machine using Weconator. Um, and uh, as my input device to capture information about gesture, I'm going to use my webcam. Um, and I've got a little program here, which I like to call the world's worst computer vision feature extractor. Um, what I'm doing is just taking those pixels coming in from the webcam and downsampling that to a 10 by 10 grid of color values. Um, and this gives me 100 numbers, and you know these numbers are going to change as I move in front of the camera, as you see. Um, but even if you're an amazing programmer, I would guess that you would not want the job of writing the program that looks at these 100 values and says something useful about what I am doing in front of the camera. So instead, we're going to use machine learning to make sense of these 100 values um, and make pretty accurate predictions about what kinds of gestures or motions I'm doing. All right, so I'm going to have Weconator here listen to 100 values from this camera program. And I'm going to build a classifier, which is going to, again, predict what type of action am I doing at the moment. And uh, we're not going to load a training set from somewhere else. We're actually going to build this training set uh, right from scratch in the demo. And I want to, you know, not just have Weconator output a number, I want to have this control a sound and make this a little bit fun, right? We're going to control a drum machine, like I said. So I'm going to run a very simple drum machine program written in Chuck. And when I send this drum machine different numbers, we're going to hear different sounds, just like this. All right, so let's start out. Let's give it some training examples. And I'm going to say that when I am right here in front of the camera, I want to hear this simple sound. So I've got 17 snapshots of me here paired with the sound. And next, I'm going to tell that when I'm not in front of the camera, turn that down so you can hear. When I'm not in front of the camera, when I'm out of frame, I want to play a different sound, specifically this one. Let's go. Okay, now I've trained, I've built my model. Let's run this model and see what happens. Okay, it's pretty good. It's definitely um, changing between the two sounds, more or less the way I'd like it to. However, it's being a little bit too eager to change to that second sound, even when I'm not totally out of frame yet. So I'm gonna give it some more training examples to try to fix that error and say that when I'm right here, Actually, I still want to hear the first sound. And now I'll retrain, I'll rebuild that model and we'll see if it works any better. And in fact, that's pretty good. Um, I can keep moving around and see if I can make it make other mistakes like right here. I can, oops. Forget I did that. Let's give this as sound one and say that I want sound one over here. And I can retrain and keep running and see that yes, it's doing what I'd like. And once I'm happy with that, maybe I wanna make more complicated. Um, I could give it another sound with say my hand in front of the camera like this. Okay, there we go. That is a pretty easy way of using Weconator to make a classifier where I'm controlling um, a few different sounds based on simple movements of my body. All right, so that demo I just showed you uh, was pretty fun. Uh, you can imagine that you know, for an audience, watching somebody move on the stage is probably more interesting than watching them just change sound by clicking a mouse button. Um, and in the hands of a good choreographer, you can imagine something that becomes really visually compelling as well as, as sonically interesting. 
Um, but when professional composers have used Wekinator, they're using it in a slightly different way, often to um, exploit the fact that you can use machine learning to build very different types of instruments. Uh, the sounds that you heard in the previous instrument were the same sounds that I could easily make by just pressing a few buttons to switch between different sound options. Um, but sound becomes a lot more fun to many electronic composers when you can explore a really big space of sounds, when you've got a large palette to draw from and you can come up with ways of playing sound um, that are much more nuanced, much more complex, more exciting than just you know, switching between a few different presets. Uh, so in this demo, I'm going to show you how you can use Wekinator with regression to do exactly that. Um, and the instrument we're going to play is going to control a sound synthesis algorithm called Blotar. And Blotar is fun because it has a lot of different sounds that it's capable of making. So here's just a, a few of the Blotar sounds. Okay. And for each of these sounds, I'm, I'm getting that sound by giving Blotar a different set of control parameters. Specifically, I'm changing nine of its control parameters. So you can think of each of those sounds as a point in a nine-dimensional space. And I'm going to build a Blotar instrument where I control these sounds using this. Um, this is a game track controller from uh, a, an old PlayStation game called Real World Golf but we're just going to use it as essentially a six-axis joystick. I get X, Y, and length of each of these two strings that I pull out of the base here. Um, and so I'm going to tell Wekinator I want to take these six input values and use them to control those nine blotar parameters, and I'm going to use regression so I get smooth changes. Um, and of course, this is, again, something that would be really hard to do even um, for someone who's an expert programmer, because not only are you trying to find good positions in this nine-dimensional space, but you're trying to come up with a mapping function that says how the motions that somebody's doing here um, move you through that space in a way that's not only musically interesting, but maybe gesturally comfortable, where um, the, the gestural mapping might be easy to learn or easy to execute certain gestures that give you sonic gestures, and so on. Um, so that's very hard to think about as a programmer. It's a complex function to write, um, but here we can do it pretty easily with machine learning. So I'm going to start out by finding a sound that I want to put in the blowtar. And maybe I want that sound, and I'm just going to put it over here pretty comfortably. Record some examples, and maybe another sound higher in pitch, say, over here. You can record some examples here, and just Training from these, you, you understand what's going to start happening. Okay, so I've got smooth change, and it's learned that lower pitch is over here, higher pitch is over here. Um, that's fine, not too interesting yet. Let's start to add more sounds in and see what happens. Put this sound over here. Should mention this is taking a little bit longer than usual to train because I'm running my video capture software at the same time. Okay, so hopefully you saw some interesting stuff happening there. Um, not only was it giving me access roughly to the sounds that I put in the training set and still having this behavior that when my hand was kind of back here, I was getting a low to high pitch relationship, um, but it was also giving me all sorts of other sounds as it, I moved you know, between these very, very different timbres, um, which I'd put in, in different parts of my gesture space, uh, I was getting sounds that I didn't put in the training set that I have never heard before, even though I do this demo quite frequently. Um, and this means that I can start gesturally exploring the space of this synthesis algorithm. Um, and of course, I can use machine learning to refine this instrument or this mapping that I've created. Uh, if I like 
a sound somewhere. I say, oh, that's a really cool sound and I like it where it is. I can add more training examples of that pair to reinforce that behavior. Or if I don't like a sound somewhere, I say, oh, you know, that's silly, that's silent, or that's just really stupid sounding. I can put a different sound in that part of the gesture space and uh, retrain it and I'll get a different instrument. And I can keep refining my instrument in this way until I'm happy with it. Then I can save the whole thing and run it, um, the models as they are during performance. Or perhaps I could even um, write a piece, and I've done this a few times in the past, where a performer retrains the instrument on stage and the evolving relationship between sound and gestures is part of a piece. Um, but most composers don't do that. Most composers spend a fair amount of time refining the instrument until it's something that they're happy with, and then they move on and, and do other aspects of the work. All right, next, I wanna show you some examples of creative work that uses Wekinator. Um, this first piece is actually one of the very first compositions ever made with Wekinator. This is from a composer named Anne Heggie. Um, here she's using this game track controller, the same thing I used in the blowtar example. Um, and she has a piece in which each performer is moving in a very particular way, sort of similar to a, a yoga sun salutation. Um, and Anne had a very uh, particular idea for the sound trajectory that should result from somebody moving through this motion sequence. And so relatively easily, she was able to say, okay, you know, when the performer's here, I want this sound. When they're here, I want this sound. Giving Wekinator some examples and then um, allowing the mapping to result in the kind of, I think, really beautiful music that you see in this video. Right. The full video, um, and indeed the full videos for everything I'm going to show you here, is in my lecture notes. Um, this next video I want to show you is from Michelle Nagai. Um, this is an instrument called Martlet. And again, Michelle was one of the very first Wekinator users, and indeed somebody who um, I worked with very closely in the design of the first version of Wekinator. And I learned a lot from her about how she thought about instrument building and how she thought about supervised learning as something that was useful in that process. Um, the instrument that she's got here, I really love it. Um, it's a piece of tree bark that she found when she was walking one day um, and she picked it up and realized that there was a hole in it that she could put her arm through and she could wear it. And she said, well, you know, naturally I want to make this into an instrument. And she embedded a bunch of light sensors into this tree bark, attached them to an Arduino. Arduino is sending the values of those sensors to Wekinator. Wekinator is running a number of regression models on that in those inputs and then sending the regression outputs to Max, where Michelle is doing her sound synthesis and sound processing. So here you can get a, a glimpse of her instrument and hear her talking about it. Basically taking the data and it's comparing it to examples that I've given it in the past of relationships between a certain data and a certain gesture and a certain sound. So if I train the machine learning software that when I you know, wrap my arms around the instrument and the sensors register less light, it makes a particular kind of sound. And then full light, it makes a different kind of sound. So I give it all these examples in the training process. Um, and then I run it and I see what happens. And, and it, it takes the data that's coming in and says, oh, that looks just like the data, or that's similar to the data that she wants that she has when she wants this sound. So it sends that message to my sound processor and the computer outputs that sound. Um, so it's just another way, basically, of mapping gesture to sound. All right, the next video I wanna show you is um, an instrument made by Letitia Tsunami. Um, 
Tsunami has been really a leading figure in um, the creation of new musical instruments for decades now. Um, for a long time, she performed with an instrument she calls the Lady's Glove, which was the first glove-based musical controller using bend sensors and you know um, magnetic sensors to, to sense really fine-grained finger position changes. Um, and so you can find great videos of her using that online, certainly. Um, this instrument, she um, has been performing and developing for a long time now, I think 10 years now, potentially. Um, this is called the Spring Spire. And so Spring Spire has three metal springs stretched across this frame. At the end of each spring is an audio pickup. And that pickup is getting, you know, at audio sample rate, information about how that string, or sorry, how that spring is vibrating. Now, of course, you could just amplify that sound and you would hear the sound of the springs moving around and that could be really cool, but that's not at all what she's doing. Um, instead, she has a series of bandpass filters um, processing each of those springs audio. So she's getting sort of instantaneous amplitude in each of a few different frequency ranges. Um, and those are the values that get sent to Wekinator. So Wekinator is getting information about really, you know, how are each of these springs moving within different frequency bands. Um, you're get, able to get a lot of information um, from that data about, you know, are you plucking them? Are you scraping them? You know, what are you doing to manipulate them? And you'll see a bunch of those gestures in this video. Um, Tsunami then uses a, a fairly large number, several dozen um, regression models in Wekinator um, to control some formant synthesis in Max MSP. She's also, as you may or may not get to see in this video, she's got a box of some sliders in front of her that she's using to do some more um, interesting effects, um, not just literally manipulating the music, but actually changing how the data gets sent to Wekinator. And so we have a, a paper about this that you can read if you want more details. But for right now, I'll just, I'll play you this video. All right, so this is, I, I just think this instrument and this piece that she's made for it are both super cool. And of course it would be insane to try to make an, a mapping out of this, to make this kind of instrument, if you had to program by hand the processing of, of how each of those spring frequency bands relates to the synthesis parameters that you're controlling. Um, but she's managed to do it, and, and in fact she has a, a number of pieces that she's performed with Spring Spire, and they all sound quite different because she's using different mappings for each one. The last example I'm going to show you um, is some work by um, someone who used to be my postdoc, Gabriel Viglian Sony. Um, he's performing here with a partner, Gabriel's on the right, and um, this is just from a couple years ago. Now, I haven't said anything yet today about generative machine learning. Of course, generative machine learning is super exciting. Um, the main way in which it differs from supervised learning that I've been talking about is that instead of just outputting a classification label or a single number, generative machine learning can output sound, right? You can just take the output of a generative model, plug it into a speaker and go, right? One of the challenges with generative models is that um, they don't necessarily come with 
really obvious ways to control that generation process in real time. Um, you still have a mapping problem. You still have this big design challenge of saying, all right, here's what the generative model can do. How do I hook up control from, you know, movements that I might be doing or some other kind of, of you know, sensing that I'm doing and hook that up to controlling this model in a, in a musical way. And so what Gabriel's got here is he's got Weckinator sitting between his input controller, which is another game track, same as N used, same as I used in Blotar. Um, he's got Weckinator mapping to what we would call the latent space of um, a generative model, um, which is making sound in real time. So here's a, a quick snippet of Gabriel's performance. All right, again, there's more you can watch online there. So let's talk next about some of the musical and creative benefits of interactive machine learning. Um, tools like Weckinator are um, not always the easiest to use, right? You have to get your head around what machine learning is, how to make a training set, how to connect it to your music uh, making components and your sensors. Um, but yet, you know, a number of people do it anyway. Why is that? What are they getting out of it? Um, this is a question that I began to explore doing my PhD work a um, long time ago now, um, but something that's continued to really fascinate me that I'm continuing to look at um, with creators in other contexts. So the first benefit um, is sort of the obvious one, and this is the reason that I began building machine learning tools for musical instrument building, right? Yes, machine learning makes working with sensors and data easier. Right? Um, in the examples that I showed you, um, first of all, people often had many different sensors, many different dimensions of input data that they were getting simultaneously. And they had to make decisions in the computer about how that data coming in should be turned into control over sound, right? This is a difficult mapping problem because you have many dimensions of input and potentially many dimensions of output. And that's just really hard as a person to get your head around. Whereas, you know, if you're using machine learning, it kind of doesn't matter. You could have a hundred sensor dimensions going in, controlling a hundred sound synthesis parameters, and you build your instrument exactly the same way. You say, hey, when I do this, I want this sound. When I do this, I want this other sound, right? So machine learning can make that work with high dimensions much easier. Another thing that machine learning can do is make it easier to work with noisy data, right? So the game track controller that you saw doesn't have very much noise in it, right? It's going to give you more or less the same values if you're in the same position, which is which is really nice. But lots of other sensors are not like that at all, right? The light sensors that Michelle had, for instance, are not like that. Um, cameras and microphones um, often are going to give you slightly different values for what feels like the same kind of musical action because the lighting might be a little bit different or there might be a little bit of background noise and so on. Um, and it turns out that accounting for that kind of noise is also super hard to do as a programmer. If you've ever tried to write code that, you know, looks at data coming in from um, from sensors on an Arduino, for instance, you may have encountered this. And then, of course, if you compound that by making your data high dimensional, it can be really feel like uh, a battle that you cannot win. Um, but many machine learning algorithms were designed precisely to be able to handle noise, to be able to generalize and say, oh, all of these things that you're doing, all of these things that you showed me, that's all class one, you know, or that's, you know, sound number one. Um, and I kind of get the idea. I kind of see what's staying the same here, and I'm going to ignore the stuff that's changing here, right? Machine learning does that kind of for free. Um, uh, I'll mention here, these are a few other of my favorite um, creative works made with Weckinator, um, where again, um, machine learning has just made this work with sensors and data easier for people in a really nice way. Um, from the right here, this is Chicks on Speed. Alex Murray Leslie did some work with Weckinator to make a shoe-based musical controller with um, accelerometers in, in, embedded in the shoe. 
Um, this is a non-musical example. This is a puppetry example where people would hold up shadow puppets um, and the, uh, based on what they were holding up, um, Wackinator would classify, I believe, what kind of scene it was in the entire puppetry performance and then project the appropriate background onto the screen. Um, and this is um, a picture of an early, some early work from a London-based company called Voclia. Um, the idea for their product is that you can sing or beatbox into a microphone and that gets turned into content in your DAW. Um, and they used Wekinator to prototype early versions of that because, um, again, you know, who wants to sit down and write code to analyze what kind of sounds somebody's making when they're beatboxing, right? Machine learning is much, much better, more accurate for that. All right. Now, the next creative benefits I'm going to share with you were things that were not at all obvious to me as somebody who came to this really, you know, with a computer science understanding, very conventional understanding about machine learning. Um, one of it, the other really important things it turns out when people find machine learning valuable is that it allows them to think in a different way when they're creating an instrument or when they're building some other sort of embodied interaction. If you, you know, imagine that you are an alien from another planet and you've come to Earth and you ask me, hey, what's, what does it mean to wave hello? I'm not going to explain the process of waving to you in English. I'm not going to write you a mathematical function that describes how my fingers and my palm move over time. I'm going to give you an example. I'm going to say, oh, this is what it means to wave hello. Um, and if I want to be really thorough, I might show you different kinds of waves, right? So that you get an idea of, okay, what is it that I mean by this concept? I'm going to use language very little. Similarly, if you think about how, if you, you know, learned a, a traditional instrument, how your teacher worked with you in that instrument, your teacher probably did a lot of demonstrations. They would play music for you. You would, they would ask you to play music for them. Um, and, you know, your lessons, your practice is grounded in sound and it's grounded in movement. Um, English or your native language, math and programming code are really bad ways to communicate about those things, whether we're communicating with a person or an alien or a computer. It's much nicer if we're able to say, hey, if I imagine a movement and I want to communicate what that movement looks like, I'm going to demonstrate it. And machine learning allows us to do that. Or if you were to say, hey, I imagine how a sound might unfold and how I might want to move along with that sound, much better to just demonstrate how you would move along with that sound than to try to capture that in math. Um, so this, again, has some benefits. The obvious benefit is that people can get the computer to, to do what they want more easily, um, but also the process can be less frustrating. So Michelle, the creator of Martlet, um, the tree instrument, um, one of the things that she said about her experience working with Wekinator was, I have never before been able to work with a musical interface that allowed me to really feel the music as I was playing it and developing it. The Wekinator allowed me to approach composing with electronics and the computer more in the way I might if I was writing a piece for cello, where I'd actually sit down with the cello and try things out. Another benefit, as it turns out, um, if we think about interactive machine learning in the, the way you saw it used in the Wekinator demos, um, it's fairly easy to build a first idea quickly. And it's then fairly easy to throw that out and do something else. And it's also fairly easy to make iterations, iterative changes on that idea. Um, this act of prototyping, of trying out and exploring lots of ideas is really key to any creative practice, right? It looks a little bit different perhaps in, in different domains, but it's part of how creators work, right? Um, there's sometimes this myth that, that hopefully nobody here truly believes that, oh, you know, to be a great composer means that you come up with the sound of something in your head and then it just, you know, comes out and you write it down in notation if you're making acoustic music or you, you know, you make your max patch and that's it, right? That's not how real people work. Real people are constantly in dialogue with their instruments and their tools of creation and they're trying things out and you might have an idea in your head uh, but then you play it and it's like no that's not quite it and you know once you hear it or once you feel it that it should be better and maybe even 
you know what exactly should be different about it. Right? So if we allow people to speed up this process of trying out a thing, changing it, and going down a path of exploration, if we reduce the friction to that, often what we can find is that people just explore more ideas and they're happier in the end with what they've got because they don't necessarily feel stuck. Like, oh, I had to write code for this really important, you know, complex mapping and it took me 20 hours and I'm not thrilled about it, but I'm stuck with it because I don't have another 20 hours to take on it, right? So machine learning can be really, really useful in this regard. Another exciting aspect um, that I've explored a little bit in my work is that designing with data rather than designing with code can enable more people to become creators. So, um, you know, as you saw in the demos, you don't need to code to build an instrument. If once you have, you know, the inputs coming in and you have the outputs going somewhere, you can do the mapping, you can build the mapping from scratch without really any technical expertise at all other than knowing which buttons to push when in Wekinator. So we explored this, um, some, some colleagues and collaborators and I explored this in a project called Sound Control. And um, here we built a piece of software that has a Wekinator style interactive machine learning workflow inside it, but also has a bunch of different inputs that you can just choose from a drop down menu. So things like a game track, things like um, using webcam to um, track a colored object or um, using a, an accelerometer that you could wear on your hand or your foot or your head, right? So all of these inputs are kind of pre arranged to fit into the system. And likewise, there are a bunch of really simple sound making modules. Um, you can have a sort of loop playback where you have multiple loops synced up with each other and you turn them on and off. Or you have a mixer where you have multiple samples that you're changing the levels on. Um, or you, you know, have some something like FM synthesis. You have a bunch of things you just kind of choose in a drop down menu set and then you can make a mapping. And in this project, we were working with music therapists and music teachers who were working with kids with a really wide variety of disabilities. Um, in many cases, these weren't kids who were going to like pick up a violin and learn how to play a violin, but nevertheless were people who, you know, could be really musical and um, benefit from the physical, the creative and the social aspects of making music. Um, so we, we made this piece of software and we were really happy in the end, the music teachers and therapists could use it successfully, even though they didn't have a lot of technical expertise. Um, and the best part wasn't just that they could use it and make instruments. The best part for me was that um, they did really weird things with it. They did weird things that I hadn't anticipated at all, that I, I don't think they had anticipated at the beginning, but by putting this instrument creation technology into their hands and allowing them to do this prototyping and exploring, they were able to find ways of using it that really worked well for them. So for instance, they you know made games out of it. Um, Rebecca, who you see here um, in the image, um, would make games where she would take the game track string and secretly make a training set and she would put different animal noises in different parts of the gesture space and then she would hide a dog sound somewhere and she would give the the string to the kid and say all right find the doggy and they'd have to to move around and and find the dog sound so i think this was this was a super fun project the last benefit I want to talk about is that machine learning allows new musical outcomes and new creative relationships between people and machines. Now, I think the musical outcomes bit should be obvious by this point, right? Lots of the instruments that I've shown you here are just not things that would be possible to create. Not, you know, the mappings are too complex to create reasonably using programming. Um, in other cases, um, you might be able to make those mappings by programming, but it might take a really long time and you might just like choose not to. Um, so undoubtedly, you can use this kind of approach to make instruments that would never exist otherwise. And those instruments can make sounds that would never exist otherwise. And that's exciting. Um, but also if you think about the ways that people engage with technology in the creation process, the, the, the instrument creation process, I think there's exciting bits there. So, um, you know, I already talked about 
how designing these new instruments can become an embodied activity. And often people have described it as a really playful activity. And, you know, that's a win compared to being really frustrated writing code that, that doesn't do what you want it to do. Um, additionally, you know, I, I asked Letitia Tsunami to talk once about why she used Wekinator to build Spring Spire. And she said, in a way, you don't want the instrument to perform like a well-trained animal circus. You kind of want it to be a little wild and you want to adapt to it somehow, like riding a bull. I think the machine learning allowed more of this fun of exploring instead of going, I have to have a result right away. This thing is going to do that and leaving it at that. Um, and I think, again, this is really exciting, and this is a property of interactive machine learning, especially when you're using regression and you build an instrument that's capable of making sounds that you didn't anticipate, especially when you have these complex mappings of many inputs and many outputs, they are going to be capable of surprising you. When you do something that's not in the training data, you might get something um, really amazing or not. But that process of building the instrument can be like, riding this bull, right? And that's, again, a very um, stark contrast to this myth of like, oh, I am a designer of a thing and I know exactly what I want to create. And so now I'm just going to write that code. I'm just going to build that and not be in dialogue with um, my tools and not be open to surprises or opportunities that arise. Um, and this, of course, um, is for me, one of the really exciting bits about uh, about this and, and why I'm still working in this area so many years later. All right, I have a few final remarks to share with you before we're done. First of all, I've really talked up interactive machine learning a lot today. It's not always the answer. It's not always the right tool. So um, if you are trying to build a model that generalizes very accurately for many people, not just something that works for you or a small number of people, um, Interactive machine learning might not be the thing, right? Maybe you're going to get a lot of payoff by going and collecting data from all of those people, or at least a representative sample of people about, you know, how they move, for instance. Um, otherwise, you're going to build something that works for you and potentially nobody else. Um, or if you're in another situation where you already have a large data set, you've collected lots of examples of, of movement and sounds or of, you know, audio that you want your model to be able to respond to, and you're confident that that data set represents the type of content or relationships that you want to model, then great. So if this is where you are, this is much closer to a more conventional machine learning context, right? Where you might be really well off with offline tools, um, working in Python, for instance, using standard machine learning libraries, where you really spend a lot of effort fine tuning exactly what learning algorithm are you using? What kinds of feature representations or, you know, types of inputs are you giving to the models? And, and your goal here is Number one, right, get a really good data set that represents what you want. And then number two, build the best model you can for that data set. Um, additionally, of course, sometimes we don't want to just generate synthesis parameters or musical control parameters. We might want to generate sound or music directly. And if that's the case, you want a model that outputs sound, well, use generative machine learning. Don't use supervised machine learning. Of course, as I showed in Gabriel Viglianzoni's piece, you can put those two things together and use something like Wekinator to control a generative model, and uh, that can be really fun. So for me, this is still a really exciting area of research. Um, I've done some work with fantastic collaborators exploring questions like, how could we build similar tools that help creators in other domains? Um, with Phoenix Perry, for instance, we've built a tool called InteractML that works in the Unreal and Unity game engines and allows you to build gestural controllers for games or to build games that respond to audio and all sorts of other um, interactions with interactive machine learning. I think there's, you know, really interesting questions to explore here about how we could use this kind of approach to help people learn about machine learning. Um, you do learn a little bit. Actually, you learn a surprising amount about machine learning if you use Wekinator or a similar tool. You learn about the sort of um, you know, flow from collecting data to training to testing out a model 
and you learn about how changes to your data are likely to affect your model. This is relevant far beyond using machine learning to make musical instruments, and it can be really fun. Um, so some of you might be familiar with a tool called Teachable Machine, for instance. Um, this is a, a web site that you can use. It's, it's free. Go try it out. It's made by Google based on Wekinator. Um, and Teachable Machine allows anybody to, you know, build an image classifier or build an audio classifier. Um, and this is used in teaching all over the world. It's integrated in all sorts of machine learning curricula for kids and adults. And I think there's more to explore here. Um, and of course, you know, some of the work that I mentioned more recently with, with Gabriel um, interrogates how we could combine some of the benefits of interactive machine learning, where we have bespoke data sets that capture exactly what a particular person wants to do, maybe even what somebody wants to do with a given instrument in a particular piece, like Letitia Tsunami. Um, also, interactive machine learning, because the data sets tend to be small, it's really quick to train them. It's really cheap computationally and financially and in terms of you know, ecological impact, it's cheap to train them and you have a really high degree of control over what they do. These are great, but um, these are kind of um, counter to a lot of the way that big generative AI models work. So there's big questions about how we could combine these um, and make generative systems that are a little bit more responsive, personal, sustainable, and so on. If you're interested in learning more, um, or if you're interested in using interactive machine learning in music or other contexts yourself, I've put a bunch of tools and resources here for you. So the Wekinator website has tutorials. It'll get you started with you know, exactly the examples that you saw in this lecture, and it has sample code for all sorts of other um, types of programs and sensors to plug into Wekinator. Um, if you are a Max person, I highly recommend Flucoma. This is a really recent project. Um, they are up to date in a way that Wekinator cannot be with the, the number of platforms that Wekinator tries to support. And I know people who have been making some really fantastic projects with that. So go check them out. If you're interested in just like trying out something as easily as possible, go to Teachable Machine and you can build a classifier in the next five minutes. Um, if you're a JavaScript programmer, ML5.js and Mimic are both some pretty cool tools. ML5 comes from the people who made processing. Mimic comes from a bunch of my colleagues here at University of the Arts London, um, as well as a few other UK universities. And as I mentioned, there's InteractML if you are a game engine programmer um, doing VR or games. InteractML is a, a tool very similar to Wekinator. Um, if you want to learn more online, um, I have a course on Cadenze called Machine Learning for Musicians and Artists. This is all about supervised learning and it goes really hands-on with Wekinator. Um, we have a slightly more recent future learn course called Apply Creative Machine Learning, which touches on the kind of interactive machine learning we saw here, as well as generative approaches. Um, I've listed a whole bunch of conferences here. I'm probably forgetting some, but if you go to um, Google or your favorite search engine and you type these in, all of these should have proceedings online that you can read um, for free um, or search on Google Scholar and you'll find authors posting their papers for free. And then, of course, I've got some other references on my course materials site. So I hope you've enjoyed this lecture. I hope you found it informative and hopefully uh, you've seen something here that might inform your own practice. Thanks a lot.